In an interview commenting on the efficacy of Satyagraha, Gandhi said, The Satyagraha movement is nothing but a movement for promoting goodwill amongst those against whom we seem to be fighting. Therefore, I have no misgiving as to the ultimate result. In reply to a question regarding his dress in England, Gandhi observed, I shall certainly not be found in European dress, and if the weather permitted, I should present myself exactly as I am today. When asked whether he would stick to his dress if invited by the King of England, he replied, In any other dress I should be most discourteous to him, because I should be artificial. The political atmosphere deteriorated. The sense of conflict grew. Gandhi toured Gujarat to give comfort and courage to peasants in the villages, ravaged by revenue officials. The Delhi Treaty was being broken in all its clauses. Peasants were subjected to coercive processes. Gandhi appealed to them to fulfill their part of the settlement, irrespective of the government doing it or not. The government stiffened its back and tightened its hold. A long and unsatisfactory correspondence followed between Gandhi and the Viceroy. The continuing harassment in the country was an indication to Gandhi that he must not sail to attend the Round Table Conference. In the final effort to reach a satisfactory arrangement with the government, Gandhi reached Simla once again on August 25th. On August 27th, his principal demand was conceded. The Delhi settlement of March 5th remained operative. The obstacle being removed, he hurried to fulfill his obligation. Gandhi reached Bombay on August 29th to catch the boat in time. A special passport was issued to enable him to make a dash for London. Despite rain, men, women and children, eager to catch a farewell glimpse of Gandhi, throng to listen to his parting message. I must go to London with God as my only guide. The horizon is as black as it could be. There is every chance of my returning empty-handed. I shall endeavour to represent every interest that does not conflict with the interest of the dumb million. S.S. Rajputana was ready to sail. The wharf was alive with people. The Indian plenipotentiary arrived not for waging a battle of diplomacy, but for embarking on his mission of asserting the right of the Indian people to be masters of their destiny and cultivating friendship with the world, for he could not think of permanent enmity between man and man. Accompanying Gandhi were two fellow delegates, Sarojini Naidu and Madan Mohan Malavia. The innermost thoughts and feelings of the people were, go forth to quaff the bitterest draughts that may yet be in store for you. Let not the thought of our misery and misfortunes make you pause. You have taught us to suffer cheerfully. You have stiffened our tender hearts into steel. What if you return empty-handed? Go and proclaim to mankind your message of love and brotherhood. At noon on August 29th, the Rajputana steamed out. Jawaharlal Nehru watched the ship that carried the sole representative of one-fifth of the human race to the Arabian Sea and the Far West. As Gandhi was drawing away from the shores, his thoughts were focused on India. 
I shall work for an India in which the poorest shall feel that it is their country, in whose making they have an effective voice, an India in which there shall be no high class and low class of people, an India in which all communities shall live in perfect harmony. This was the India of Gandhi's dreams. Gandhi was in the best of spirits during the voyage. Riding the pitching seas like a veteran mariner, he selected for himself a corner on the second class deck where he spent most of the day and the whole of the night under the canopy of the starlit sky. The quaint traveller carried the scantiest of luggage and scrupulously observed his daily routine on board the ship. To Gandhi, spinning was a sacrament. He felt that every time he drew a thread on the wheel, he was coming nearer to the poorest of the poor and through them to God. He said, it is a symbol not of commercial war, but of commercial peace. For every revolution of the wheel spins peace, goodwill and love. The spinning wheel is for India's starving millions the symbol of salvation. In a jubilant and almost boisterous mood, he played fairy godfather to a child. He never felt so happy as in the company of the little bird, and the child was happy and hilarious in his company. Children are my life, said he. He mixed with his fellow travellers, capitulated smilingly to passengers seeking snapshots, and gave autographs. The voyage provided him with much needed rest. He heeded only to the promptings of goddess sleep and slumbered deeply. He spent time in reading and writing, answered correspondence and sent dispatches to his papers. As the right hand suffered from writer's cramp, he wrote with his left hand. Gandhi gave his testimony on prayer. Prayer has been the saving of my life. As food is indispensable for the body, so is prayer indispensable for the soul. I am indifferent as to the form. His host, the captain, treated him with every mark of respect and invited him to go round the ship. I am your prisoner for a fortnight, said Gandhi. He was conducted to the captain's bridge. He tried out the various nautical instruments and exhibited keen interest in each device. It was time for the life jacket drill and Gandhi readily participated in it. Throughout the voyage, Gandhi endeared himself to the fellow passengers by his unfailing courtesy and gentleness.
After a weary voyage of 1,660 miles, daylight broke over the rock-crested shores of Eden. Gandhi steered the Rajputana into the first port of call. I hope I do not capsize the boat, he remarked, as he turned the wheel. A big welcome awaited Gandhi at Aden. He arrived at the citizens' meeting to receive an address of welcome and a purse. In his first public speech outside the Indian subcontinent since 1914, he declared that India did not stand for isolated independence. One fifth of the human race, becoming free through non-violence and truth, can be a great force of service to the whole of mankind. He extolled the simple way of life associated with the Khalifs and told the Arabs to help solve the Hindu-Muslim problem. As the ship was gliding through the Suez, messages of welcome from the Egyptians poured in. On crossing the Egyptian waters, Madame Zaglul Pasha sent the great leader of Great India her best wishes for the success of the Indian cause. In the name of Egypt, Mustafa Nahas Pasha, president of the Waft Party fighting for Egyptian independence, greeted the great leader Al Mahatma Gandhi and wished him success in his quest. Gandhi thanked them and reciprocated kind wishes for the independence of Egypt. At Port Said, Gandhi told the journalists on board the ship that he would heartily welcome the union of the East and the West, provided it was not based on brute force. On the ship, Gandhi gave discourses on non-violence. His contention was that as life persisted in the midst of destruction, there must be a higher law, the law of love, which worked like the law of gravitation. That the force of non-violence was infinitely more subtle than the material force of nature, and that opponents should be conquered with love. Gandhi had in his loyal secretary Mahadev Desai, an assistant who not merely relieved him of much of his routine work, but put his keen intellect and tireless capacity for work at his disposal. Mahadev's devotion to Gandhi was complete and Gandhi's affection for him deep and unbounded. On the misty cold morning of September 11th, SS Rajputana anchored at Marseille. Madeleine Roland greeted Gandhi on behalf of her ailing brother, Romain Roland, with a message, the better Europe is with you. The world press was represented to cover Gandhi's arrival. I shall do everything at the spur of the moment, depending on my inner voice, which means God will guide me, he told the journalists. When the spiritual ambassador of India alighted on the soil of war-weary Europe, he was hailed with shouts of Vive la Gandhi! Gandhi expounded the message of non-violence to the students of Marseille, saying that it was a weapon not of the weak but of the strong. On the train to Port Boulogne, 
A correspondent asked, How long do you, you intend to be in London? I know your tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you want to say just a few words? <laughs> yeah. Hi. <laughs> Would you say a few words for France, Mr. Gandhi? You don't know. Only for French. 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 I can call the French. Finish. Finish now. <laughs> ah, that's lovely. Huh? At Port Boulogne, Gandhi was given a friendly ovation. The party boarded the channel boat to Folkestone. While the boat steamed along, the temperature began to drop, and yet Gandhi had wrapped himself only in a shawl. To the marvelling pressman, Gandhi's explanation was, My dress is the symbol of my mission. At Folkestone on September 12th, Britons gathered to greet the guest of the nation. Gandhi landed on British soil with thoughts of the hard task ahead. I am here to vindicate the honor of India and to uphold truth as I see it, for I believe it is the keystone of life. He was driven straight to the friend's house in London. A surging crowd stood for hours on Euston Road awaiting Gandhi's arrival. All facets of public life were represented at the Quaker Centre to welcome him as an instrument of the synthesis of politics and religion. Explaining his mission, Gandhi said he had come absolutely in a spirit of cooperation and to strive for an agreed solution between India and Britain. Gandhi had accepted Muriel Lester's invitation to stay at Kingsley Hall, a centre dedicated to the slums of London. The people of East End opened their homes and hearts to him. A little cell on the flat roof with an open view was put at Gandhi's disposal. The members of every section of Bow assembled outside Kingsley Hall to welcome Gandhi. I am thankful that I got this opportunity of being surrounded by these happy children and seeing the homes of the poor. He was soon at home among the workers. He felt happy because he got here a taste of the life he was pledged to live. Then began the inrush of visitors of every shade of opinion. The pearly king, accompanied by his son and daughter, came to pay respects to the distinguished visitor in his domain. Gandhi greeted the costermonger royalties who offered him their best oranges. Take the orange, yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Why well, take only one? I take two. Kill. <laughs> In his first ever broadcast talk, Gandhi told the American people from Kingsley Hall, the world is sick unto death of blood spilling. Perhaps it will be the privilege of the ancient land of India to show the way out. At the Federal Structure Committee of the Round Table Conference held at St. James's Palace, the voice of resurgent India spoke through Gandhi. The goal of absolute independence remains intact. Gandhi stressed the need of adult suffrage and racial equality and advocated an honourable partnership between India and Britain. The nation that does not control its defence forces and external policy, asserted Gandhi, is hardly a responsible nation. He struck a note of warning. A nation of 350 million people needs simply a will of its own to say no, and that nation is today learning to say no.
To create greater understanding about India's case, Gandhi spent more time in meeting leading celebrities and visiting interesting places. He met Charles Chaplin, of whom, curiously enough, he had not heard. They talked about the toilers, the underfed, and the use and misuse of machines. Gandhi's visit to Lancashire afforded him an opportunity to come into friendly contact with the mill owners and workers. In this center of the British textile industry, the mayor of Darwin welcomed the most uncompromising advocate of the boycott of foreign cloth. Asking the workers not to attribute their miseries to India, Gandhi poured out his heart to them. I would be a false friend if I were not frank with you. He explained how economics, ethics and politics were inextricably mixed up in his life. My nationalism is not so narrow that I should not feel for your distress. I do not want my country's happiness at the sacrifice of any other country's happiness. You have three million unemployed, but we have nearly 300 million unemployed and underemployed for half the year. Your average unemployment dole is 70 shillings. Our average income is seven shillings and sixpence a month. If India could revive the living corpses by putting life and food into them in the shape of work, it will help the world. He pointedly asked the operatives, do you want Lancashire's prosperity to be built upon the ruin of the Indian artisan? Their spontaneous reaction was, we know each other now. Uh, you would just like to say a few words. You are going to tell the other children that I love you all as my own children. That's all I want to say. Gandhi expressed his gratefulness. I shall treasure the memory of these days to the end of my earthly existence. In a recorded talk, Gandhi sought to prove the existence of the benevolent power God. I do dimly perceive that whilst everything around me is ever changing, ever dying, there is underlying all that change a living power that is changeless, that holds all together, that creates, dissolves and recreates. That informing power or spirit is God. For I can see that in the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence I gather that God is life, truth, light. Faith transcends reason. Being His Majesty's guest, Gandhi felt morally bound to accept the invitation to attend his reception. He went to Buckingham Palace in his usual dress. The round table conference was completely abortive. Every divisive tendency in India was encouraged. The conference concluded on December 1st. Gandhi's 12 week stay at East London, which afforded him an opportunity to see the best side of human nature 
and lent support to his belief that at the bottom there was neither east nor west, came to an end. After planting a tree in front of Kingsley Hall, his parting message was, Whatever the result of the mission that brought me to London, I know that I shall carry with me the pleasantest memories of my stay in the midst of the poor people of East London. On December 5th, 1931, Gandhi left Britain without any disappointment. I carry with me the pleasantest recollections of many happy friendship calls. The call from India was peremptory. Gandhi boarded the channel boat to the French coast on the way home, leaving behind seeds of goodwill and mutual understanding. On his homeward journey, Gandhi landed in France. The crowds overwhelmed him with their welcome. During his one-day sojourn in Paris, Gandhi spoke to an attentive audience. I know that we have to go through still more suffering to vindicate our position. Next day, he departed for Switzerland. Gandhi came to Geneva to spend a few days with Romain Rolland, the sage of Villeneuve. The two kindred souls, tormented by the spirit of darkness engulfing the world, met at Villa Olga on the bank of Lake Leman. Rolland described the blighting effects of exploitation and the perils of war. Gandhi affirmed that nations should cease to answer violence with violence. Gandhi's routine of taking early morning walks continued despite the severe December cold. One evening, at Gandhi's request, Roland played on the piano an andante movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, representing the triumph of the heroic will over the deepest gloom. At a meeting in Geneva, he pointed out, My speeches at the Round Table Conference have all officially reported. Meanwhile, I must ask you to believe me when I say that I have never made a statement of this description that the masses of India, if it became necessary, would resort to violence. All that as you like. It is complete independence that we want. God, Gandhi said at Lausanne, is an eternal principle. That is why I say the truth is God and the way to him is through love.
After five days' stay in Switzerland, Gandhi left for Italy. At Rome, Gandhi was cheered by enormous crowds. He was received by General Morris, a friend of Romain Rolland. The movie tones grunted, journalists struggled, but Gandhi had decided not to make public statements. During his three days stay in Rome, he had a packed schedule. He was able to see something of the ancient city. He made a hurried round of the Roman ruins. The Vatican galleries were specially opened for Gandhi. Their art treasures interested him immensely. Gandhi's eyes fell on a striking statue of Christ. He went up to it and stood in deep contemplation. Gandhi saw here that nations, like individuals, could only be made through the agony of the cross and that joy came not out of infliction of pain on others but out of pain voluntarily borne by oneself. Gandhi was shown a military exercise and drill by little boys known as Balila. Pleasure to see all these young children hail and hearty. Thank you, Thank you Thank very you much. much. <laughs> right. On December 14th, Gandhi boarded SS Pilsner at Brindisi en route to India. After his experience in England, it was clear to him that the true battleground was not London, it was India. But in ignorance of the situation at home, he reiterated that he would try every means to avoid another fiery ordeal. On December 28th, two days after the arrest of Jawaharlal Nehru, Gandhi reached the shores of India. Though he had returned empty-handed, he had not compromised the honor of his country. A great ovation awaited him. Gandhi was unprepared on landing to find intensified repression and special ordinances in operation. The truce had been done to death. The die seemed to be cast.
Bombay staged a magnificent welcome to Gandhi. Thousands turned out en masse to greet him. The streets were lined with greatly excited crowds. National flags fluttered everywhere and banners and arches adorned the whole of the long route to Mani Bhavan. Gandhi encamped on the terrace of Mani Bhavan and acquainted himself with the situation. He found things blacker than he had imagined. That evening, people flocked to Azad Maidan to listen to Gandhi. A vast concourse of humanity stretched far beyond the Maidan. At five o'clock, Gandhi arrived to give his appraisal of the situation and ascended the twenty feet high rostrum. In reply to the demonstration of tumultuous welcome, Gandhi condemned the attempt of government to unman a whole race. He emphasized his eagerness to cooperate with the government, though he was ready for a struggle if necessary. If a fight is inevitable, he asserted, I would expect every son of the soil to contribute his might. I would not flinch from sacrificing even a million lives for India's liberty. He exhorted the people to get rid of the fear of death and adhere to non-violence. He made an impassioned plea for raising the level of the untouchables, realizing that without it, Freedom would be futile. Gandhi gave detailed account of his work in Britain to the members of the Congress Working Committee. He discussed the grim situation in the country with his colleagues and sought an interview with Lord Willingdon to find a way out. On receiving a stiff reply from the Viceroy, Gandhi had no choice left but to resort to civil disobedience. He prepared to go to jail. His message to the nation was to wake up from its sleep and respond to the challenge of the government without hatred or malice, for our quarrel is not with men, but with measures. To poet Tagore he wrote, I want you to give your best to the sacrificial fire that is being lighted. The government instantly struck back, and when the whole nation was asleep, Gandhi was put under arrest at 3 a.m. on Monday, January 4th his weekly day of silence in the tent on the terrace of Mani Bhavan. After the prayers, he was taken away and was once again interned in the Yeravada jail during the pleasure of the government. India was numbed by repression. It was a conflict of two historical forces. The jails began to be filled with civil disobedience prisoners their idealism and pride led them to fetters. It was a tribute to the national movement.
Week after week, news of black repression all over the country trickled into Gandhi, cribbed in the prison yard. But, as conveyed in his letter to the Secretary of State for India, what filled his mind above all was the contemplated separate electorate for the depressed classes under the new constitution. On August 17, 1932, the British Premier's communal award confirmed Gandhi's fear of a perpetual bar sinister which separated the untouchables from the Hindu fold. Gandhi felt impelled by a voice from within to offer resistance with the whole of his being. He informed Ramsay MacDonald that he would fast unto death from the noon of September 20th if the decision was not abandoned. In the early morning of September 20th, Gandhi wrote to Tagore, I enter the fiery gate at noon. Your blessing will sustain me in the midst of the storm I am about to enter. In a yard of the gaunt grey prison at Yerovda, the fateful hour approached. The jail bell struck twelve, and with the last stroke, Gandhi commenced his vow of extreme self-sacrifice. In a press interview, he explained, I have undertaken fast at God's call for the eradication of untouchability, root and branch. My fight is against the impure in humanity. To do away with all those social inequalities between man and man, exhorted poet Tagore, let us join the Mahatma in his noble task of removing the burden of ages upon those who have been stigmatized for the accident of their birth. There were spontaneous demonstrations of love and grief. People suffered from poignant pain and anxiety. Millions offered prayers and fasted and demanded complete removal of all religious and social disabilities of the depressed classes. Gandhi's fast renovated the dream of achieving India's national solidarity. Irrational curbs cramping national life showed signs of tottering. Temples after temples were open to the untouchables. They could now draw water from public wells. What social reformers could not do for decades was thus achieved in a few days. While the whole country outside was seething, 63-year-old Gandhi, under the shade of a mango tree in a segregated prison yard, was perfectly calm and serene. His condition was steadily worsening and his vitality ebbing. Before this stupendous self-sacrifice, all differences were forgotten. On the fifth day of the fast, the caste Hindus and the depressed class leaders, in consultation with Gandhi, signed the pact accepting joint electorates. The Yaravada pact nullified the British Premier's decision. Gandhi broke his fast of six days and five hours. Naming the untouchables as Harijans, God's own people, Gandhi began conducting the weekly Harijan from the prison, which brought about a renaissance of faith and hope for millions. Pleading for temple entry, he argued, it is the one spiritual act that would assure the untouchables that they are not outcasts before God. In response to a peremptory call from within, Gandhi decided to undertake 21 days purificatory fast from May 8th for gaining greater watchfulness in connection with the Harijan cause. He was released on the same day and he completed his fast in Pune.
On July 31st, Gandhi disbanded the 18-year-old Sabarmati Ashram as a gesture of sympathy with those who had lost property in the freedom struggle. He made it over to the Harijan cause and shifted his headquarters to Vardha, the geographical center of India. On November 7, 1933, Gandhi started from Vardha on an all-India tour for the uplift of the downtrodden Harijans and to restore equality between man and man. His plea was, the inner oneness pervades all life. God is one, and all life is from Him and in Him. Untouchability is the very negation of this magnificent truth. Gandhi was on the move, addressing meetings, opening wells and temples for the Harijans. He auctioned articles presented to him and collected funds for their cause. People loosened their fists, coins and jewelry poured in. His reaction was, I want your hearts also with your money. Gandhi had one mission before him the eradication of untouchability. If we believe that we are all children of one and the same God, asked he, how can there be untouchability amongst us, his children? He organized village sanitation on a rational basis and exhorted the Harijans to give up eating carrion and drinking liquor. He lightened their miseries and restored their self-respect. While Gandhi was touring South India, a great earthquake shook North Bihar on January 15, 1934. Giving expression to his belief that physical calamities are related to men's morals, Gandhi observed, with me, the connection between the cosmic phenomena and human fate is a living faith that draws me near to God. He suspended his tour, rushed to the scene of the calamity and proved to be a source of solace to stricken Bihar. Gandhi renounced the use of conveyance for the Harijan tour in Orissa for cultivating more intimate contact with the villagers who he wanted should awake, arise and realize the sin they had inherited and harbored. Gandhi's whirlwind Harijan tour of the country ended at Banaras on July 29, 1934. The impression left on his mind was that untouchability is on its last legs. The outstanding event of the 49th session of the Congress held under the presidentship of Rajendra Prasad at Abdul Ghaffar Nagar, Bombay was Gandhi's retirement from the Congress for having failed to persuade it to change its creed from peaceful and legitimate to truthful and non-violent methods. On October 28, 1934, the Congress reiterated its confidence in Gandhi's leadership while reluctantly accepting his decision. Gandhi justified his physical severance from the Congress. For me, to dominate the Congress in spite of fundamental differences is almost a species of violence which I must refrain from. No leader can give a good account of himself if his lead is not faithfully, ungrudgingly and intelligently followed. 
Henceforward, my interest in the Congress will be confined to watching from a distance, enforcement of principles for which it stands. I would love to serve the Congress in my own humble manner, whether I am in or outside it. Realizing that revivification of the villages, which were perpetually exploited, was a necessity if India was to exist and a remedy for its progressive poverty, Gandhi took his abode in the ashram at Wadha. For him, Khadi was the son of the village solar system and the various village industries its planets. We should, he argued, identify ourselves with the poor villagers, live as they live, help them to produce what we need and make full use of the local raw material, local talent and local tools. Distressed at the penetration of the machines in the villages, Gandhi observed, from times immemorial, the villages of India have been pounding their own paddy. Unpolished rice and hand-ground whole wheat flour, apart from being nutritious, also provide employment in the rural areas. We have suffered the village oilmen to be driven to extinction and we eat adulterated oils. Gandhi persuaded the villagers to take to more rational ways of diet. In all our dietetics, he argued, we mistake the shadow for the substance, preferring bone white sugar to rich brown jaggery. His plea was that mechanization is good where hands are too few, but an evil where there are more hands than are required for the work, as is the case in India. The remedy suggested by him was the protection of the village industries, the village crafts, and the workers behind them from the crushing competition of power-driven machinery. Gandhi believed that if the village perishes, India will perish. Persuading the villagers not to turn open healthy spaces into breeding grounds for disease, Gandhi suggested burying of the night soil as the most economic method of its disposal. When mixed with refuse, it can be turned into golden manure. So long as you do not take the broom and the bucket in your hands, you cannot make your towns and cities clean. And cleanliness is not only next to godliness, it promotes health. Gandhi believed in the infinite capacity of the soul for self-control. He gave a stern warning that birth control by artificial means will lead to moral bankruptcy. He regarded women not as an instrument of animal pleasure, but as the mother of man and a trustee of the virtue of her progeny. Nonviolence which was at the root of all his activities, was not confined only to India. Mussolini's attack on Abyssinia disturbed Gandhi. He appealed against the wave of darkness that was about to sweep the whole world. If the recognized leaders of mankind, who have control over the energies of destruction, were holy to renounce their use with full knowledge of the implications, permanent peace can be obtained. Nonviolence to be a creed has to be all pervasive. It is my unshakable belief that India's destiny is to deliver the message of nonviolence to mankind. Being convinced that the real India dwelt in her villages, Gandhi tramped to Segan, later called Sevagram, 
a decadent village five miles from Vardha, on June 16, 1936, to attain self-realization through the service of the village folk in steadfast faith. He reached his destination, lived in a one-room mud hut, and was soon at work. Visitors from far and near began to gravitate here. Drawing inspiration from his new abode, he associated the villagers with the community life of the ashram. Sevagram Ashram was but an experiment in truth and non-violence. Gandhi lived here with Kusturbai as a villager of his dream. The simple life was his chosen way. Here Gandhi lived and worked, beginning his day before dawn, never missing his prayers. The little hut remained the scene of his many activities from morning till night. He spun for hours and carded his cotton. The greatest of my activity is charcha. I hold it to be the best part of my service social, political, and spiritual. Sometimes he was engrossed in examining the details of the latest model of the spinning wheel and making suggestions to the designer. People, high and low, sought refuge in the little mud hut where he dwelt it also became the venue of the meetings of the Congress Working Committee. He did justice to all items, grave or gay, important or unimportant, for nothing was too trivial for him. He looked into every detail himself, visited the ailing inmates who were treated according to his method of nature cure. Among the patients was a leper, a profound Sanskrit scholar. Who will look after him if I don't, thought Gandhi, and gave daily massage to him. He determined the patient's diet and made a scientific study of the leprosy germs to evaluate his progress. He never failed to greet the newborn calves in the ashram. Lying with a mud poultice on his abdomen was a part of his permanent treatment for blood pressure prescribed by himself. He knew the wonderful properties of Mother Earth. That is why, instead of treading upon it, I have it on my head and on my abdomen, he said. It was his infinite faith in God that gave him the patience of a Job and his unfailing good humor. The morning and the evening constitutionals were as much a part of Gandhi's regular routine as the prayers. Details about the kitchen or the crops were discussed with those in charge of them. Often interviews of a serious nature were given and press statements dictated during the walks. In accordance with his desire to be in tune with the infinite, he slept under the open sky. To promote contact with the villagers, the first village session of the Congress, according to Gandhi's conception, was held at Fazpur under the presidentship of Jawaharlal Nehru in December 1936. Vast, unsophisticated crowds throng Tilaknagar, the bamboo village. All arrangements were befitting the village life. President Nehru dwelt upon the growing menace of fascism in Europe. 
He hoped the logic of events would lead to socialism for India's economic ills. Though Gandhi took no part in the Congress debates, opening the Khadi and Village Industries exhibition, he said, It is not enough that one wears Khadi if he surrounds himself with Videshi, things foreign in everything else. Khadi means the truest Swadeshi spirit. Indian economic independence is not a product of industrialization, but economic uplift of every individual by his or her conscious effort. Real socialism has been handed down to us by our ancestors who taught all land belongs to God. Like the earth, we of it also belong to God, and hence we must feel like one and not create boundary walls. Gandhi realized that in the long run, the future depended on the village school. He expounded the theory of education through vocation, which could promote the real disciplined development of the mind by drawing out the best in the child and yet keeping him rooted in the soil with a glorious vision of the future. He wanted education to be based on village occupations and easily accessible to all. Though education was to be based on a craft, Gandhi insisted that the child's intellect and heart were to be trained as much as his hands. Gandhi, in his retirement from the Congress, was no less a force than when active. His advice on political affairs was constantly sought. In February 1937, on the Congress securing signal success at the polls, Gandhi advised the Congress majorities in seven provinces to form cabinets to hasten the march towards independence. Office acceptance created a new ferment that began to leaven the dough of national life. Gandhi wrote, the offices have to be held lightly not tightly. He insisted that ministers dare not live in a style and in a manner out of all correspondence with their electors and exhorted them to eradicate red tape and to conduct themselves with ability, integrity and impartiality. For Gandhi, office acceptance had a special meaning for progressive amelioration of the toiling millions. He stressed the need of immediate enforcement of prohibition, removal of untouchability, free and compulsory primary education, conversion of jails into reformatories, and tax-free salt for the poor. The 51st session of the Congress met on the bank of the river Tapti at Haripura, in rural surroundings, under the stewardship of Subhas Chandra Bose the youngest president in February 1938. At the Khadi and Village Industries exhibition, Gandhi observed Khadi has been conceived as the foundation and the image of Ahimsa. A real Khadi wearer will not utter untruth, will harbor no violence, no deceit, no impurity. Do what you do for the sake of India. If you wear Khadi for my sake, you will burn Khadi on the day you burn my dead body. But if you have fully understood the message of Khadi, it will long outlive me. After hoisting the national flag, President Subhas Chandra Bose said, Our struggle is no doubt a non-violent struggle. But even a non-violent struggle demands an army, an organization, and a machinery. India is going to be free 
and that we who live today are going to play a part in making India free. There is no power on us that can keep India enslaved anymore. Let us strive for India's freedom one day more. President Bose and the members of the working committee arrived at the open session of the Haripura Congress. President Bose put forward a case for national reconstruction. Our chief national problems relating to the eradication of poverty, illiteracy and diseases can be effectively tackled only along socialistic lines. The state, on the advice of a planning commission, will have to adopt a comprehensive scheme for gradually socializing our entire agricultural and industrial system in the spheres of both production and distribution. Voicing the feelings of the nation, he concluded, All India prays that Mahatma Gandhi may be spared to our nation for many years to come to keep our struggle free from bitterness and hatred. We need him for the cause of humanity. The Haripura session condemned the federal scheme for India on the ground that a constitution for India must be framed by the people themselves. In September 1938 came the moral catastrophe of Munich. Compelled to heed the rumbling of the coming storm, Gandhi observed, the peace Europe gained at Munich is a triumph of violence. It is also its defeat. The science of non-violence can alone lead to pure democracy. The plight of the Czechs moved Gandhi to the point of physical and mental distress, advising the small nationalities to refuse to obey Hitler's will and perish unarmed to save their honor. He maintained that if it was brave to fight, it was braver still to refuse to fight and yet refuse to yield to the usurper. Soon after the Munich crisis, Gandhi traversed the whole of the northwest frontier province with Abdul Ghaffar Khan. The Pathans, old and young, received Gandhi with joy. Badshah Khan was convinced that non-violence could elevate his people and raise them to their full moral stature. Guiding the non-violent organization of Khudai Khidmatkars, Gandhi said, the very name suggests that they are to serve and not to injure humanity. Non-violence is not a mere passive quality. It is the mightiest force God has endowed man with. As a person who relied upon the use of force would have to undergo military training, so will a soldier of peace have to go through a definite training. Gandhi rounded off his tour by a visit to the remains of the Buddhist monastery at Takshashila, which reverberated with the ancient maxim, let man conquer anger with non-anger. Gandhi took leave of the pageant of India's glorious past that lay spread out before him. 